Let me uh, take a minute to introduce you to our co-sponsor today. Mason, Hayes and Curran is one of the, uh, the largest business law firms in Ireland. Their areas of expertise include uh, M&A, securities, tax, finance, uh, financial services and litigation, in which areas they are uh, objectively ranked as uh, one of, if not the top uh, law firm in Ireland. Um, motivated by uh, what was uh, seen by us as an increasing level of interest on the part of Canadian businesses in Ireland, not only as a gateway uh, to Europe, but as a great place to do business. Uh, together with the Mason, Hayes and Curran firm, uh, we decided that the time was right to pull together a group of experienced uh, business people uh, and experts to uh, talk about doing business in Ireland. And so with that, let me introduce you to uh, uh, your host, uh, representative of your host firm, uh, Emer Gilvery. Uh, Emer is the uh, chairperson of Mason, Hayes and Curran. Uh, and in her own right, is a formidable leader of the legal profession in Ireland. Emer? Good morning, everyone, and thank you for that introduction, Minister, Ambassador. Thanks so much to everyone for being here this morning. It's wonderful to see a full room. Um, thank you in particular to Scott and the Gowling WLG team who put an awful lot of effort into this program. And it is about timing. Because I suppose Canada and Ireland are two of the most outward facing economies that we have in the world. And we find ourselves in a strange place because our respective largest trading partners and our next door neighbors are taking a different path of travel and they're looking to internalize, or at least that's what we think they're doing, and they're looking away from globalization. So we need to look at that as an opportunity. Some people might call it a challenge, but Irish people are really good at taking up a challenge. And I think we found that out and we learned a lot about ourselves when we went into a deep recession in 2008. Yeah, heads were down for a while, and I was reminded about many times about what W.B. Yeats said about the Irish when he said, being Irish, we have a deep sense of tragedy, which sustains us through temporary moments of joy. <laughs> <laughs> but you know something? We picked up that ball and we got back on the pitch and we now have an even stronger, more diversified economy. And we kept doing what we do best and that is attracting and retaining business in Ireland because it's what we're good at. And I know with Brexit people say there's lots of opportunity for Ireland. We've been taking those opportunities for decades and we're good at bringing people into our economy and into our society. The panel discussion this morning therefore is very timely, very relevant, very current. But before we get to that, we are honoured to have our keynote speaker here this morning, Ms. Minister Coveney. And I'm going to invite the Irish Ambassador to Canada, Ambassador Jim Kelly, to join me now to introduce our keynote speaker, Ambassador Kelly. Uh, thank you very much, Emer. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, Minister, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want first to congratulate our hosts, Gowling and their event partners, Mason Hayes Curran, IDA Ireland and the Ireland Canada Chamber of Commerce here in Toronto for putting this event together today on the theme of Ireland, a new gateway to Europe. We in the Irish Embassy are also delighted to be associated with this morning's breakfast and as well to see such a, a strong turnout of companies and business people from a wide range of sectors here. When my uh, colleague Emmanuel Dowdall from IDA Ireland in New York asked me to participate here this morning a while back, I was delighted to accept. Uh, for me, as a relatively new ambassador, I'm about six months here in Canada, the theme of the uh, unique opportunity that Ireland offers to Canadian business at this moment of change and challenge in the world 
has been a central part of my message in my own engagement with business and government interlocutors across Canada. So I saw this morning's event as an excellent opportunity for me to explain to you as business people why there has never been a better time to invest in and trade with Ireland. Now, I know, of course, that business people like nothing more than opportunity, but I know that they never say no to an upgrade either. So when we heard that we would have a senior government minister in town this week ahead of St. Patrick's Day, we felt sure that you would appreciate hearing his personal views and insights on the theme of today's breakfast. And we're delighted that he's agreed to be with us here this morning to share his thoughts with all of you. So let me briefly introduce him to you. The first thing to mention is that Minister Simon Coveney is from Cork. And if you know Cork, you will appreciate how important that is in the, the scheme of things in Ireland. He was first elected to the Dáil, the Irish Parliament, in 1998 as one of his Fine Gael Party's youngest TDs or Members of Parliament, rising over the course of his parliamentary career to serve from 2011, first as Minister for Agriculture, where he drew on his own academic background in agriculture and land management, and was appointed Minister for Defence also in 2014. With the return of a Fine Gael government following the 2016 election, Minister Coveney was appointed Minister for Housing, Planning and Local Government, a complex portfolio which includes responsibility for a number of sectoral areas key to the long-term health of the Irish economy. And with Brexit looming as both a major challenge and an opportunity for Ireland over the coming years, Minister Coveney also brings valuable direct experience of the European Union and its institutions following a term as a member of the European Parliament from 2004, during which time he served on both the Parliament's Foreign Affairs Committee and its Internal Market and Consumer Protection Committee. So Minister Coveney brings, I think, a unique combination of experience and insight, both domestic and European, to the theme of this morning's discussions. So, without further ado, I'd like you all to give a very warm welcome to Ireland's Minister for Housing, Planning and Local Government, Simon Coveney. Uh, thank you, uh, Ambassador. Thanks, Jim. Uh, and thank you, Emer, as well, uh, particularly for that nice quote, uh, which I think kind of sums up the Irish. Um, look, they like to be miserable, but actually uh, um, find, find ways of being joyous as well. Um, I'm particularly pleased to be here, and this is the first event uh, that, I've, um, uh, that I'm at. Um, my own family is very much uh, affected by, by Irish immigration to Canada. Uh, I'm married to, uh, uh, to, to one of 12 children, seven of which are in Canada, or seven of whom are in Canada, five in Toronto, one in Vancouver, one in Victoria. Uh, and her uncle uh, actually was the longest serving mayor of uh, Port McNeil uh, and built a, um, a big um, uh, building and logging business there. Um, so this is, a, this is a country that we as a family I have a real closeness to, and it's a, it's a privilege as a minister to be here uh, in the build-up of St. Patrick's Day. And thank you for those of you who have really searched to find green ties to wear them this morning. It's appreciated. <laughs> it's appreciated. Mine comes out once a year, too. <laughs> um, as I say, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here with you this morning uh, to offer an Irish government perspective uh, on the topic of today's forum, which is Ireland a new gateway to Europe. And before I address the topic, I want to congratulate the organizers, uh, our hosts, Gowlings, and their partners for today's event, the Irish legal firm Mason Hayes Kern, who I know well in Ireland, and who I would strongly recommend to any of you uh, who need legal advice or assistance uh, in the context uh, of Irish Canadian business. Um, uh, and I also want to thank, of course, uh, the Irish, uh, the Ireland Canadian Chamber uh, here in Toronto, the IDA, Enterprise Ireland, <coughs> Enterprise Ireland, who are here, Tourism Ireland, who are here, and of course the Embassy uh, through Jim. Uh, the initiative which you have uh, taken uh, has brought us together this morning for an important and timely discussion, discussion on what Ireland has to offer to Canadian companies seeking a new gateway to Europe. And I'm delighted to see uh, a number uh, of significant investors in the Irish economy will be speaking to you also later on. It's important because we know that there are uh, considerable uh, challenges, but also opportunities for Ireland and Canada working together. It's timely because we're on the cusp of seeing a 98% uh, of our bilateral trade liberalised uh, by a landmark EU-Canadian Comprehensive Economic Trade Agreement, or CETA, as you all know it. And that can help us unlock that potential 
uh, by offering Irish and Canadian companies a boost uh, of a new competitive advantage in each other's markets. The specific opportunity which CETA offers our two countries should also be considered against the backdrop of an ever more challenging international trading environment. We have to acknowledge that we both live and trade in very uncertain times. Canada's largest trading partner and its closest neighbour, the United States, has recently expressed it, its intention to reopen NAFTA. Uh, it has even spoken of introducing uh, new border taxes on imports. Meanwhile, Ireland's largest trading partner and closest friend, the UK, has also chosen to leave the European Union and will do so, uh, or start the process of formally doing so in the coming days. This is a huge decision for the UK, but it's also a huge decision for Ireland, for all sorts of reasons that many of you who come from Ireland would understand. Faced with these challenges, our bo both of our countries uh, have an opportunity uh, to seek uh, support with each other uh, and opportunities uh, in the context of outward looking international trade. Canada and Ireland uh, need look no further than each other uh, in this context. From an Irish perspective, the opening uh, provided by CETA uh, could uh, uh, not have come at a better time. The ups and downs of the Irish economy over the past decade, I think are well documented and have already been referred to. <clears throat> but I would like to say a few words about the Irish economic situation so that you're clear uh, on where Ireland is at right now. As you know, we have come through a very difficult period. In the wake of an international financial crisis, uh, the government was forced to take a series of very tough decisions to repair our economy and place our public finances back on a sustainable footing. This was a difficult task with, which necessitated great sacrifice on behalf of many people, but it's now complete and a strong and sustainable economic recovery is now firmly established. All key e economic indicators point to continued solid economic growth in Ireland. Despite a challenging regional and global environment, we have had the fastest growing economy in the European Union for the last two years and may well have so again in 2017. And we are predicting uh, at least 3.5% GDP growth this year. This growth is broad based uh, and our economic fundamentals remain robust. Exports have grown strongly while the domestic economy is now driving growth with private consumption up by over 3% in the first three quarters of last year. Employment has increased in every quarter uh, over the last four years. The total numbers of jobs uh, ha has increased by over 200,000 since, um, uh, since mid 2012, uh, and there is now more than 2 million people at work, as many as there ever have been in Ireland. In February, the unemployment rate stood at 6.6%, if you look back six years, that figure was close to 16%. And that just shows you the pace of change uh, and progress in terms uh, of economic opportunity. For anyone seeking to inv an investment base in Europe, it is a very different Ireland to that which you have read about in the post-2008 period. With business facing a complex and uncertain world, Ireland offers you a stable, competitive, secure and very pro-business economy with a well-educated and productive workforce and a reputation for excelling in research and, cr and creative discovery. And the markets recognize this too. The cost to us of borrowing on international markets is close to historic lows. Irish bond yields uh, uh, are, uh, are trading in line with European sovereign bonds and the yield on Irish government 10-year bonds is trading steadily at close to 1%. We have regained an A-grade status from all major sovereign debt rating agencies. Against this backdrop, the number of new investments secured in Ireland in 2016 rose by 14.6% to 244 in spite of global economic uncertainty, intense competition from other jurisdictions and a changing global taxation landscape. Over 40% of these were new name investments. Our stable business environment and our certain access to EU markets mean that we remain extremely well placed to win new FDI investment in Europe. To all of this, our continued membership of the European Union is absolutely critical. So what then of the UK's decision to leave the EU? What will it mean for Ireland in terms of both challenges and opportunities? Let me begin by saying that we regret 
the EU's decision to leave the European Union, though we respect, of course, their decision. We have long been, been uh, conscious of the potential implications for Ireland of a Brexit and have been proactive in identifying and prioritising those challenges, readying ourselves to meet them and work hard to build a high degree of understanding among our EU partners uh, uh, for those particular priorities. Over the past two years, we have conducted a detailed analysis of the likely impact of Brexit on Ireland. We are clear uh, uh, on what's involved uh, across some 11 working groups uh, in what is a whole of government approach. We have identified risks, mitigation measures and opportunities for us arising out of Brexit. Uh, each of these are being pursued. Our key priorities, uh, including preserving our strong bilateral trade relationship with the UK, the maintenance of the common travel area between our two countries, a, a, and critically for the whole of Ireland, the preservation, the preservation of a hard-won achievement uh, of the Northern Ireland peace process and ensuring no return to hard borders on our island. While we know uh, that Article 50 uh, is likely to be triggered this week. Uh, that is really just the start of a two-year process uh, that Ireland needs to be central to in terms of those negotiations uh, on the European Union negotiating side. A, a fourth area uh, of priority for us uh, is to influence the future of post-Brexit EU. The fundamental point to note here uh, is that the future of the European Union's ma Union matters to Ireland because it's our future too. And I want to emphasize it because this basic fact has at times been misconstrued in international reporting of the Brexit issue, including here in Canada. Let me be very clear on this. Ireland will be participating in these negotiations as a member of the European Union. And we will, in all circumstances, continue to be, co to be a committed member to the EU in the future. We understand very clearly that EU membership is overwhelmingly in our national interest, politically, economically and socially. Our membership uh, in the European Union has provided the foundation for much of the dramatic economic and social progress which Ireland has made over the last four decades or so. Membership of the single market and the customs union remains fundamental to our success in attracting inward investment and helping Irish companies to diversify and grow their export markets. And as a small country uh, whose values and interests converge in support of a rules-based multilateral order, the EU continues to provide us with the essential means to protect our foreign policy priorities alongside like-minded partners. So even as we seek to manage the challenges with which, uh, which Brexit will pose for Ireland, we reject any notion that this will require making a choice between the EU and the UK. And this is the view not only of the government, but also of the wider public in Ireland, where surveys regularly show that more than 80% uh, support continued membership of the European Union post-Brexit. So while the UK is our closest neighbour, and as I said earlier, in many ways our closest friend, uh, we are going to remain in the European Union uh, and we will help them, I hope, in the future to develop and maintain a close relationship with the European Union as a whole, but in particular with Ireland. A crucial look at the Ireland-UK trade relationship helps, helps to explain why we need to balance uh, our support for membership of the European Union, uh, but also maintain a close relationship with the UK. Ireland and the UK joined the then EEC at the same time in 1973. At that time, the UK accounted for 55% of all uh, Irish trade. We were heavily dependent on the UK. But our membership of the European Union has brought us enormous benefits, not, not least of which has been our access to a single market uh, of today some half a billion people. It, it has enabled us to, to develop structurally and economically and to diversify our trade relationships significantly. Today, 40% of Irish trade is now with all other EU member states, compared with 14% with the UK. Brexit still represents significant challenges for us in this regard, uh, given the relative concentration of SME exports to the UK market, particularly from my previous brief, brief which was agriculture and food. But it is important to see these challenges too in a wider context of our growing trade with Europe and indeed the rest of the world. And I hope 
to an increasing level with Canada. So when, the art, when Article 50 uh, is, is triggered uh, by the UK Prime Minister, Ireland will be part of Team EU in the negotiations, and moreover, we will be uh, keen to maintain unity uh, among what will be, uh, uh, at the time, uh, an EU 27. We, we will work for solutions which meet our specific challenges and minimise the, uh, the damage uh, to our political and economic interests uh, in the context of the UK's departure. Even as we seek to minimise these costs, our government will continue to take measures to mitigate the potential impact of our economy and help make Ireland what's becoming known as Brexit ready. Having prepared ourselves properly, uh, we will bring a calm and constructive approach, I hope, to, to the negotiations, which even before they've started, uh, in many ways uh, have attracted uh, unnecessarily aggressive language on both sides. We have no wish to see anybody punished. Our overall interests lie in our membership of a vibrant and successful European Union, which maintains the closest possible relationship with a stable and prosperous and outward-looking United Kingdom. So as a member and a close friend and neighbour, so as, a, as an EU member uh, and a close friend and neighbour, we will work very hard to maintain the, the closest possible relationship with our British friends and to ensure a strong EU-UK EU, relationship and a well-managed and orderly UK withdrawal from the Union. Then, of course, there are the opportunities. Uh, as a committed member of the Eurozone, uh, as well as uh, the EU, with a highly educated English-speaking population, a business-friendly environment, and a common law tradition, we will be keen to maximise the opportunities in terms of attracting new jobs and investment. Uh, looking at those uh, attributes, I believe that we offer a particularly compatible business environment for Canadian companies whose, uh, face, who face decisions uh, on new investments uh, or on relocation of existing operations for investments. On the other side, we're focused on a Brexit-related diversification of exports to other key markets. The arrival of CETA will heighten our focus on Canada uh, as one of those key markets, and the government plans to send a ministerial-led trade mission to Canada in late in late May, early June, to spearhead this effort. So in more specific terms, what does Ireland offer new investors? Uh, that, after all, uh, is the, the question, I think, uh, for many of the companies that are represented here this morning. Uh, we have a strong pool of highly skilled multilingual workers in uh, uh, the only English-speaking country within the Eurozone, providing barrier-free access uh, to an EU market uh, of, as I say, nearly half a billion consumers. 40% of our population is under the age of 29. It's the youngest population in the European Union. Our education system ranks in the top 10 in the world, and over 50% of Irish 30 to 34-year-olds have a third-level degree, higher than in any other country in the European Union. Ireland offers a pro-business environment, together with a stable and competitive corporate tax regime and, and strong incentives for research and development. We have maintained our position as the best country in the Eurozone for doing business in the Forbes ma ma magazine ranking in 2016, coming overall fourth in the world. This ranking is testament to Ireland's favourable business climate and regulatory climate. We are one of the most competitive economies in the world. Competitiveness gains have been sustained as the economy grows strongly, with inflation below the EU average since 2008. Our improved competitiveness position is reflected in global competitiveness reports. The IMD ranks us uh, first in the Eurozone, fifth in the, OEC fifth in the OECD, and seventh in the world for overall competitiveness. And Ireland is one of the most productive economies in Europe. Irish labour productivity is almost 35% above the EU27 average. Ireland is ranked first in the world for the flexibility and adaptability of people, first for finance skills, and third in the world for productivity uh, of companies and workforce productivity. This being the case, Ireland is increasingly home to international talent. With a, an overall uh, proportion of 15%, Ireland is the third highest international workforce in Europe. 11% uh, uh, of workers uh, come from other EU countries. Perhaps it's not surprising, therefore, that Ireland is home to nine of the top 10 global software companies, nine of the top 10 US technology companies, all of the top 10 born on the internet companies, nine of the top 10 global pharmaceutical firms, and I live in 
one of the largest pharmaceutical, next to one of the largest pharmaceutical hubs in the world uh, around Cork Harbour. Uh, 15 of the top 20 global medical technologies companies. The market speaks for itself uh, and Canadian investors have been an important part of that success story. Canadian investment in Ireland uh, is estimated uh, at about 14 billion uh, Canadian dollars. And major uh, investors to date uh, include uh, Great West Life, uh, who purchased Irish Life in 2013, uh, Couch Tar, uh, who uh, ha have acquired uh, the, the Topaz chain, uh, and Irving Oil, uh, who last year acquired the, the Whitegate refinery. And I, I was there that day. And what a fantastic family story uh, that has grown out of Canada, which is now becoming uh, a, a global um, player in relation to, to oil and refining. We hope that many more Canadian investors uh, will follow their successful footsteps uh, and Canadian access to our markets will undoubtedly be helped further by the entry into force of CETA. Um, uh, Canadian uh, and EU businesses will now uh, compete on a truly level playing field by removing almost all the customs duties which uh, importers have had, uh, have had to pay uh, on exported goods. Uh, CETA will benefit exporters and investors as well as consumers and CETA will create jobs on both sides of the Atlantic. So can I say to you that uh, I'm here as, a, as somebody who really values the Irish-Canadian relationship. Uh, it's one of extraordinary generosity on behalf of Canada as a country. Uh, we have seen tens of thousands of young Irish men and women come to Canada and build a life here. And I hope help to build a better country here uh, with many people uh, in this room. Uh, that continues and has continued in particular since 2008 in, in, in the most recent past where we've seen about 100,000 young Irish people come to Canada to work here. Just to put that into context, that is the population of Ireland's third largest city um, choosing to come to Canada uh, to be part of the four and a half million uh, who call themselves uh, Irish Canadian or Canadian Irish. Uh, and so we can build on that relationship in a way that opens up the doors to, to economic business opportunities. We can learn from each other. Ireland's not perfect, and I'm sure we'll hear from the investors uh, uh, in a few minutes' time about the good and the bad uh, and the challenge, uh, challenges of, of growing business in Ireland. Uh, but I do think our record speaks for itself. There are very few companies come to Ireland to build platforms for international trade and growth that choose to leave again. Very, very few. And most of them end up growing and expanding and employing many, many more people there from what they had intended to do when they come in. Um, so I regard the relationship with new companies that come to Ireland as a partnership, not only from a business perspective with the partners that you choose to do business with, but actually a partnership with the Irish state, including, including government, um, so that we ensure that those business decisions and that appetite for risk to come to Europe and use Ireland as your gateway into Europe is actually the su success story that you hope it will be. So thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me this morning and I look forward to your questions if you have them. Thank you, Scott, and thank you, Minister and, and Ambassador. And um, that was a terrific uh, uh, overview of the future of, of opportunities for Ireland. Um, I want to invite up some, uh, some folks that I've got to know quite well here um, gentlemen, why don't you come up and join us here, um, and I'll just introduce you as you come up. Um, and we have the benefit of um, now uh, learning about some um, business businesses that are that are active in Ireland today. Um, that um, you know, regardless of what happens with regards to CETA and Brexit and NAFTA and whatever other acronym you want to throw out there, um, you know, these are these are gentlemen who are actively uh, carrying on. Uh, their organizations are actively carrying on businesses in Ireland today. They're Canadians. They're based here, um, and um, and and they've they've got some interesting um, stories to tell. Um, what I'll do is I'll briefly introduce them. The more detailed bios are in the materials that you've already got, um, and then we'll we'll cover some. We'll let them introduce their organizations uh, briefly, so you can get a sense of what's what's um, what they've been up to. So, just in 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 brief. Um, so the the Three gentlemen here in the middle. We've got um, Jay Hayes, who's a professional engineer uh, with over 25 years' experience, uh, entrepreneurial uh, track record 
in uh, various uh, companies, but he's currently with a company called Eastend Tire, which is based in Cambridge, Ontario. Uh, and he's, in the time that he's been there since 2010, they've grown by more than 20, uh, 20 times their size. He's a recognized and respected uh, and reliable voice on topics uh, with respect to cybersecurity throughout North America and throughout Europe as well. Um, and so he's going to talk to us a bit about Eastend Tire. Um, to his right is David Ehrlich. David is a lawyer by, by, um, uh, by training. Uh, he's currently the CEO of Irish uh, uh, residential properties REIT, um, IRES, and, and he's, um, uh, but he's got a long history uh, of experience in uh, practicing law in, in the, in the, um, within uh, Stegman Elliott, uh, one of the firms that I deal with on a regular basis. And then finally, to my immediate right um, is Christian Karg Samard, who is very, very relatively recently the uh, the CEO at, of Advantis uh, Zinc, which is now listed um, uh, listed company here, and um, is uh, has uh, Zinc assets, Zinc de uh, development assets in both uh, Canada and Ireland. Um, and I'll let him walk through details. He's spent many years as an investment banker before that. Um, and I was also a, a mining executive. He too is a professional engineer, um, and uh, and Hales originally uh, did his uh, uh, his uh, uh, degree at uh, UBC. So we've got great representation across three different sectors uh, of of the economy. You know, like like uh, Canada, it's a, it's a mixed economy. We've got some mining expertise. We've got some technology expertise and some real estate expertise. So um, I'm going to call upon David to speak first. And David, we've we've um, we've provided some materials um, that David's uh, provided with respect to IRES. Uh, and if you want to take a copy when you go, we're happy to provide it to you. And then we're going to call upon um, uh, Christian to sort of provide an overview of of Advantis and its opportunities. And and then we'll have Jay speak for a few minutes on that. And then we'll we'll go to questions. All right. Thanks, David. Great. Thank thank you, Ian. Um, the genesis of IRES goes back to 2014, when Canadian Apartment Properties REIT, which is Canada's largest multi-res REIT, um, and has always owned uh, apartments only in Canada, uh, decided that um, they should uh, look uh, internationally at some other opportunities. And um, the, the, one of the early places that they looked at was Ireland. Now, why? First of all, it is English speaking, which is a major advantage for, for doing business, um, particularly in the apartment sector where there's a lot of communication between staff and, and uh, apartment tenants. Um, secondly, there had been this crash um, such that there were assets to buy from a government agency that had been formed to take over the bad loans and assets from the banks when the banks were bailed out. Ireland is a country historically of owners, not renters. The only rental market of, uh, uh, of any significance um, was buy-to-let units, like a dentist might own three units, the doctor might own two units, but um, the cab driver will own 10 units. And, um, and though they um, did not provide professional management services, so to try to buy two units here and two apartments there and so forth would have taken forever. So it was a one chance opportunity because these assets went into a government um, related agency called NAMA. Um, it gave an opportunity for, for Capri to, to grow the portfolio. So the question then became, how do we, without employing a disproportionate amount of our own capital into this, expand this? And um, we watched the REIT mar market, the new REIT legislation come in in Ireland, watched two others go public, and we're now the largest non-governmental landlord in Ireland in only three years. We have uh, about a billion dollars Canadian of, uh, of apartment assets and, uh, and some related commercial space. Um, and we're listed on the Irish uh, uh, Stock Exchange. So it's been a very um, successful uh, effort for us, and we are continuing um, to grow. And I'll say more about that uh, later. Th thanks, David. That's, that's great. That's great. 
Um, I'm going to turn it now over to, uh, to Christian. And Christian, I've got some slides here. You can tell me when to go forward. Right, thank you, Ian. So as you mentioned, uh, Adventists went public uh, last month. We were the first uh, mining IPO on the TSX in several years. What uh, Adventist is trying to do is uh, create a global zinc exploration and development company. Um, our, the private team started working in Ireland about five years ago. If you think about zinc and where you want to start a major uh, zinc company, you, you think about Ireland. Ireland has the highest zinc concentration in the ground of any spot on the planet, and it currently hosts Europe's largest zinc mine owned by Belieden. Uh, that mine generates somewhere between a billion to a billion and a half of revenue uh, each year and has recently made, made a major discovery. So I think the mining industry has been a major part of, of Ireland for many years. It will be a major part many years going forward. Uh, over the last five to six years, we assembled the second largest exploration license position in Ireland. And we also have a significant license position in Newfoundland, which has many Irish ties as well. So we've used these uh, properties as a basis to go public, but our, uh, we've got high aspirations in terms of growing this company globally and have put together a, uh, a strategic shareholder base that is backing us with several hundred million dollars, uh, two private equity groups, a large royalty company that's based out of Newfoundland, Canada, and a Canadian billionaire. So we're looking at opportunities uh, worldwide to acquire zinc exploration development assets uh, we'd love to grow in Ireland. We have uh, our sights set on several opportunities, and we're spending uh, millions of dollars on exploration currently in Ireland. For an investment banker, a former investment banker, you're very efficient with the with the presentation. So there you go. So Jay, over to you. The, the gauntlet has been thrown down. <laughs> yes, uh, I was going to compliment the minister on his um, practice in speaking to Canadians. I understood every single word. <laughs> I have an office in Cork, and we have to have subtitles when we do conference calls. Like it's, <laughs> and it's technology, so as different uh, as property and mining, um, and that's actually kind of an interesting representation of Canada. We are right in a high-tech sector, and this is our elephant in the room. You know, every firm will be hacked, and you know why we had to go to Ireland to get some help. And there's a, a long history in um, in Ireland, probably 20 plus years in Cork specifically where McAfee, and many have heard of the antivirus company, uh, set up shop, originally I think induced through a tax, uh, uh, R&D tax uh, um, uh, set up, and, um, and then, then another cybersecurity firm, another one. So there's probably 20 to 25 there. And, and the biggest challenge in the industry is access to talent. Um, you know, fast forward from 20 odd years ago, we have uh, educational institutions now training the type of staff these firms want to hire. And uh, if you start looking uh, for concentration, there's some uh, 3,500 to 4,000 cybersecurity skills right in, in the Cork area. So, so we, had, um, we had a requirement to, um, and this is uh, fairly recent, um, we brought an investment round in in 2014. And one of the missions was to create um, a, uh, a redundant, highly resilient uh, um, security operations center um, somewhere other than Canada. And in the U.S. with Patriot Act, uh, which is, um, you know, the, the, that's changed to Freedom Act, but um, there was a high, uh, uh, high uh, degree of apprehension having workloads managed by folks in that country. So I would basically wipe out any European or Canadian sales opportunity if workloads were going to the U.S., so it's all around data privacy. However, Ireland being in the EU gave us that advantage. We looked at a couple other locations, um, uh, The Hague, which has Europol and NATO, uh, Cyber Command, uh, and then the Greater London area. And um, I didn't actually go on the, on the t we had three teams go to separate uh, locations, and I went to, uh, to The Hague and um, the other couple teams, and one of them went to Cork. So, so that's how we uh, ended up in Cork. Um, I'll give you a little bit more color on uh, the business. We actually sell to mid-sized firms, and, um, and it's, it's managing cybersecurity risk uh, at the very front lines of, uh, of protecting the networks. And our customers are asset managers, private equity firms, investment bankers, uh, hedge funds. And um, we've grown uh, this little Canadian company to secure, it's actually close to three and a half trillion of Wall Street assets. And, uh, and we are on the front line and uh, we, we, have, we you know, pinch ourselves every once in a while and also break out into cold sweats knowing what uh, kind of responsibilities we have. But it's, um, having, um, 
having uh, that obligation to protect uh, has, you know, we've got relationships with U.S. regulators and law enforcement because it's now deemed to be critical infrastructure as, as it should be. So in picking a location, we have to be able to, you know, have the staff that can deliver the service at a level. Um, we're growing rapidly, and uh, every time we're adding customers, we're having to add more people. And the, the heart of our business is people. Um, our assets, you know, pull out of the parking lot at, you know, six or seven o'clock every night, and we can't do what we do without the people. So, so for us, our, our, attract, uh, our attractiveness to the area was, was driven by the people. The other locations had the people as well. Um, then, you, then you look for other, um, other uh, um, elements like the legal environment, um, the ability to, um, to work with the educational system to get the next generation. We like to use the term, you know, different gene pool or DNA pool to uh, make sure that we have the diversity. You need to have a very uh, tech, um, uh, well-supported environment, and the tele telecom industry, I haven't been mentioned yet, but the, the amount of services that we require are right at the upper limit, and so we've managed to create you know, uh, primary and backup data centers in um, Ireland uh, that, that mirror what we've got in Canada. So you have to have access to all of, all of these things. And so we set up in uh, Cork, and um, there's a tech park that was a converted uh, military barracks. Um, we have the officers' barracks, uh, and it's all been refitted into a nice uh, modern um, um, office space, as uh, you can see. There, we, um, we had uh, to sort of reinforce the minister's comments. We had uh, Minister Sean Sherlock uh, at the opening, and that, of course, attracted a lot of visibility, and that helped. So we, um, in, um, from a standing start, went from nothing, um, a $2.5 million investment, and a fully operating a security operations center in nine months, which was three months ahead of plan. Um, that's, that's, that's very fast. Uh, we brought um, the, um, the team uh, from Cork uh, over to uh, Canada, did some immersion uh, training and, in the summer, and, and they were hitting the ground running. So, uh, so that, uh, that worked out very well. We, we've hired from uh, the Ministry of Defense, um, um, and uh, one of the uh, officers we had hired when he was an officer in the military, this was his barracks. So it was kind of an <laughs> interesting uh, <laughs> closed circle there. So I'll pause there and, and then answer some more of the, the questions that we've got laid out. All right, terrific. Um, so we, we, um, I, got, I got a few questions here. We've talked about some of these things um, already, but uh, perhaps um, I can, um, you know, Jay, you've touched on this a little bit already, but you know, you've got a home base in Canada um, and this is your roots. And you've talked about um, um, this. Can you compare doing business in Ireland? I mean, the minister talked about some, frankly, great stats about uh, about the uh, Irish economy. But how does it compare to uh, to here in Canada um, in, in your in your experience working here? With uh, so, so in the uh, in the tech world, it's you know it's hiring and recruiting people, and um, you're you know as a business operator, you got to manage gross margins. So to give you an extreme case, um, our gross margins would be half if I staffed up this uh, group in um, Washington or San Francisco. So we wanted to have something that was somewhat on parity with, the, uh, with our local uh, rates here, which are, you know, it's not the cheapest in Canada, but we're certainly not, um, not at the San Francisco rates. So it's almost uh, identical in fact, um, with, uh, with Ireland, uh, with Cork specifically. It might be different in Dublin, but Cork for us is, is almost identical. It's also a captive area that would, um, that uh, you know, people don't generally come there, move there. You know, it's a two and a half hour train ride from Dublin. And they're gonna you know, move there and, and move back. So we've got people in, in a captive uh, uh, environment. Um, I think it's, um, it was surprisingly easier for us. I mean, the amount of um, you know, development assistance we got in Canada, was, you know, I, there wasn't very much, uh, and, and it wasn't organized. Uh, we worked with the IDA um, extensively. Um, they were the easy button. If I were to sort of pick, um, you know, when you're going to, you know, have to, you know, find a location, they, they had, a, like, everything laid out, uh, all the things that we had to contemplate, like, you know, where do we rent, where do we get a building, where, you know, who can furnish it, wh which telco suppliers, uh, you know, here's the people you need to meet at the universities, and it was, it was so well organized. You can tell that they have done this for at least 20 years compared to, say, The Hague or, or uh, the Greater London area. It was a degree of maturity. I don't think we in Canada could do the same job trying to attract. So, so those, were, those were a couple things on the inbound. The legal environment is very similar to here. So all of that, the payroll and benefits, that was very easy for us to get going. So some stuff we can certainly learn from our colleagues and friends over yeah. in, in Ireland. 
David, um, yeah, I, reflect I, upon that a little bit? Yeah, I, I think um, uh, Canada has a lot to learn from, from Ireland. Um, not just as Jay referenced, um, having a, a, a minister there to you know, open a, a building and so forth. Um, but we, we've been there for, for three years. Um, Minister Coveney, since he's uh, uh, been elected, we not only have access to him, to the Minister of Finance if we wanted and have had, um, but we actually have a dialogue going. And there are some real challenges facing Ireland. Um, there is a um, real shortage in, in accommodation that's um, a- almost uh, unimaginable, uh, both uh, in, in housing, social housing, as well as uh, apartments and single family ho- homes. Because what happened in 2008 when things fell off the cliff, they just didn't develop anything anymore. So um, that's good for us in our business. Uh, we also think Brexit will and already has attracted new potential um, tenants for us. But in terms of uh, on an ongoing basis, the minister has brought in some new regulations which have um, made development there easier and faster, although it still needs further work as you know he himself uh, uh, admitted. And um, the cost structure there and, and, and so forth uh, needs to be uh, so improved, and I think they can learn more. And I've spoken to Minister on uh, on this uh, uh, more than once um, from Canada in terms of building for rent units, which has never been part of the Irish experience. So it's in Canada. If Capri, you know, being the largest landlord in the country, even and the largest in the GTA by far, were even to want to see the mayor. Uh, about uh, about something can be a, a protracted uh, process, let alone something nationally. So, um, you know, as, as has been mentioned, regulatory language, it's no different than another jurisdiction in, in Canada that Capri would go into in the Maritimes or in Quebec uh, in, 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 in particular. Um, but the, the access to the government and support and interest by the government in foreign investment, in real estate, they recognize that only foreign capital can help solve this, uh, this terrible problem in, in, in housing. So um, they are um, very, very um, accessible. And that's something I think it's not just you know, a welcome wagon, gift kind of thing. Uh, on an ongoing basis, is if you have a problem, you have somebody to talk to. And that's the biggest difference I could think of. Okay, thank you. Uh, Christian, you're, you know, you've obviously spent lots of time as an investment banker dealing with international jurisdictions all the time. What, reflecting upon what Jay and David have said, what, what's, the, what's your, your experience with Ireland and in, in the sector you're focused on? Well, just like uh, Canada, mining is a pillar of the Irish um, economy. Uh, They've been mining for centuries, primarily uh, in zinc. Um, The Navin mine that I mentioned has been operating since the 60s and will probably be operating for several more decades. Uh, So there's a real strong knowledge uh, base of of mining in in Ireland. Uh, Very strong geologist, miners. Uh, That skill set can be transferred worldwide. There are many Irish miners and geologists working in Canada and and, and vice versa. Um, So there's a real great cultural fit between uh, the two countries. Uh, Ireland is a neutral country. Um, And to give you a sense of the excitement currently in mining in Ireland because of the the strength in the zinc price, Toronto just hosted the world's largest uh, mining conference that happens each year. It's called PDAC. Uh, I participated in, in a bunch of the events on the technical session day, the afternoon, it was standing room only. And on the Tuesday night at the pub, uh, it was also standing room only. There was a lineup uh, right, right out the door. But uh, there's about 20 or so major companies, uh, international companies work in Ireland, many of them Canadian. Uh, and there's just a long history of working together. Thank you. I'd like to spend a couple minutes. We don't have a lot more time, unfortunately, and I'd like to spend a lot of time. but. I, want to, I do want to touch on the topic of CETA and, and whether you, you reflect upon what you heard from the minister. Um, you know, what you, what do you, how do you see trade involving Ireland and Canada and into the EU? Um, you know, do you see opportunities 
to take advantage of CETA and expand um, both in Ireland and beyond in the EU countries. Um, and you know, what do you, how do you, how do you reflect upon that? And I, I'm going to start with Christian, and I'll let the other two gentlemen um, respond as well. When it comes to mining, I'm not sure that CETA is going to be a huge benefit. Uh, mining is definitely a, a global industry, and you go where where the mines are. I'd say, in terms of the EU, the biggest uh, driver for, in particular, zinc mining, and and zinc, of course, big part of the Irish economy, is it's probably the most important metal in our top three important metals in, in Europe, as the use of zinc is primarily for uh, galvanizing steel for, for vehicle production. And uh, it's very close to potentially being a strategic metal within the EU. And as a strategic metal, there's a significant uh, further um, tax breaks, incentives, et cetera, that could come out of that. So that could help uh, Ireland in, in, qu in quite a big way. Also, when it comes to mining uh, within Ireland, uh, we're supporting the rural sectors uh, of the country, which is, is somewhat different than my counterparts here. But uh, the Irish government uh, is uh, definitely promoting that investment in the rural sector. Some of the areas are quite depressed, and there's opportunities for, for grants for, for companies like ourselves as well. Thank you. Hey, Jay, what's your thoughts? Uh, so, somewhat similar. Like we already had all these decisions done and, and implemented before, you know, CETA looked like it was going to, you know, be a, a, a ratified. But um, but we, um, I think the uh, elevated visibility will be helpful uh, on on the trade. So we're we're in the EU. Uh, one of the challenges uh, many of you may know in Canada is bringing. Um, uh, uh, foreign workers in, and uh, un until very recently, it was like a 15 to 18 month, uh, you know, speed bump. And so we've got a candidate that we want to get out of, uh, you know, Hungary or something, and I just I can't get them here. So there's been a bunch of lobbying done, and now we have a temporary foreign visa expedited process. It's imminent. Uh, it'll be two weeks, uh, like nothing else in the world. It's kind of in a big contrast to the U.S. But, um, but we have, uh, we, you know, as I said, talent and spe specific kinds of talent are what we wanted to access. So by being in the EU, we had that, uh, that you know, the, the free flow of, of talent. So that, that to us, I think, uh, with the visibility of CETA will probably boost uh, the fact that we're here. The, uh, I had mentioned uh, the privacy legislation. Uh, privacy by design is the model that uh, the EU has implemented. It was developed by our privacy commissioner of Ontario, former privacy commissioner, and Kabukian. So, so that's how that's how tight the the legislation is. So, the subsequent um, years will be interesting because there's a new law called GDPR, uh, General Data uh, Protection uh, Law in uh, the EU, which has um, security reporting obligations that uh, are like nothing we've seen in the world. And anybody doing business there, even if you're not incorporated, will have this challenge. So, how that gets bound in with the Canadian. Um, a sort of less uh, onerous uh, uh, regime will be quite interesting um, in CETA, and I've not heard any dialogue on that. I think those are, every time it gets into the media, is great for us, and, um, and um, it just you know, elevates the visibility. Right. Yeah, it's for, every, for every opportunity, there's also a challenge. Yeah, exactly. I mean, for, for us, it's, it's more indirect. I mean, um, the more trade between Canada and Ireland, um, to replace what may be lost with the UK, particularly in the interim, uh, is obviously good for the economy there. Um, we're not as dependent on that as, as other sectors. If it slowed down uh, a bit, it would not uh, uh, you know, be a, a huge problem for us. Um, I think that um, uh, the, all these companies that are looking to come to Ireland, you all need uh, residences for your employees. Uh, and so the extent that those ties uh, uh, come together, um, we're 99% we're full. So we've never had a block of apartments to offer to, um, to foreign uh, companies coming in. Uh, we're now uh, in the process of getting planning permission for roughly 450 apartments. We have others uh, well in the, in the pipeline. Uh, and so we're trying to be part of the solution to the housing problem in Ireland, but we're also um, directly in touch with um, foreign companies that are, are looking to, to move uh, uh, people or have moved and are, are in somewhat unacceptable um, uh, housing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you to, the, uh, to our, our panelists, Christian and Jay and 
David, for taking the time out of your day and sharing some thoughts and experiences you've had. Um, I think it's uh, really been <coughs> insightful. So thank you very much. Uh, yes, we've got a panel of experts here today, so I'll introduce them um, from your right to left. Uh, first, Emmanuel Dowdell is the Executive President of uh, North America for the IDA uh, Ireland, which is the Irish state agency which is responsible for attracting uh, inward investment and probably the most successful such agency in the world, founded 68 years ago. Uh, and probably a, mar a model for similar such agencies around the world. Don McCutcheon uh, is a former senior official at the Canadian Department of Finance and a senior policy advisor at uh, Gowling WLG. So in his previous roles, Don was involved in virtually all areas of government policy and actively involved in the negotiation of the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement. Uh, Jamie Fitzmaurice, to his right, is a partner uh, my partner in Mason Hayes and Curran's real estate team, and Jamie has an international facing commercial real estate practice with a particular specialization in portfolio acquisitions for private equity buyers and REITs, uh, including for IRES. Paul Carenza is a partner in Gowling WLG's Toronto office and a member of its firm wide tax group. So, Paul advises domestic and international uh, clients on tax acquisitions structuring uh, and uh, new reorganizations. And I really appreciate uh, that Paul today is uh, uh, taking up the, a difficult role as the only tax advisor on the panel. He'll be uh, facing some questions, I'm sure, on Irish tax, which is a little unfair, <laughs> but it's a reflection of his international expertise that he's agreed to answer some of them. He's up to it. And I, I, I believe he's up to it. We want, we want to talk about today is uh, specifically the ways in which Ireland may provide a good gateway or jumping off point for Canadian companies uh, into the world's uh, largest economy with 500 million uh, potential consumers. And I think I want to start with uh, some, ta uh, some questions on tax because we've, we, some of the previous comments, some of the questions that have already been asked have uh, hinted at the Irish tax story, which is a, a key but not the only part of its attractiveness to business. But Paul, can you summarize for us what the basic tax advantage of using Ireland as a uh, business hub are? Sure, good morning. But before I answer the question, David, I'd like to thank you for, for your <coughs> efforts and those of your partner, John Gulliver, in uh, bringing me up to speed Give me a crash course on Irish tax. <laughs> Un unfortunately, neither of them were capable of bestowing upon me that accent. So d despite any substance that I delivered today, I clearly will not be able to do it in that delightfully lyrical Irish way. So yes, the minister made a couple of references. Other speakers have made references to the competitive corporate tax environment in Ireland. It all starts with a 12.5% rate. So while some of you may have heard of other jurisdictions where there's uh, virtually zero tax, keep in mind 12.5% is comparable to a Canadian rate of 27%, a US rate in the high 30%. So having halving what we have in Canada and more, but that's wrapped up in the context of a tax regime that is EU and OECD compliant also wrapped in a regime that has 72 tax treaties with other countries. So we're talking about a, uh, a, a fairly low rate tax jurisdiction, but that is not one that is the, uh, in the crosshairs of every international organization that is trying to shut down quote unquote uh, tax havens or otherwise shut down what's perceived as uh, improper tax arbitrage between jurisdictions. So uh, drilling down into that, what's the sweet spot for a Canadian company or group that may be considering uh, using Ireland as a hub? So three points uh, that I'd like to make. One is <clears throat> the, the use uh, of Ireland as a, as a hub for a North American business to service its uh, non-North American clients, in particular Europe, Middle East and Asia. So the proverbial UMIA hub. So setting up the Irish resident company that, as I mentioned, is subject to a 12.5% corporate rate. 
depending on the business that's often capable of, of providing the sales or licensing into those UMEA countries without actually creating a permanent establishment in those other countries, with the result that there is no taxation in those other countries, and the entire profit is, is taxed in Ireland at 12.5%. In some cases, the, the, a local establishment in those UMEA countries is required. <clears throat> those arrangements are often structured in a, as a limited recourse distributorship or a contract manufacturer, so trapping somewhere, say, 5 6% of the profit to be taxed in that other country with the balance, again, subject to Ireland's 12.5% rate. Coming up the ownership chain back to Canada, properly structured, there should be no additional Canadian tax when that income is earned or when it's repatriated by way of dividend to Canada. So a fairly attractive, uh, a fairly attractive uh, benefit to using Ireland. Another point is the IP regime that is in Ireland. So a, a, an Irish uh, resident entity can go out and purchase IP, and there's a fairly uh, generous uh, amortization or tax deduction uh, regime that goes along with that. <clears throat> and so the profits that are generated from that IP start off with the 12.5% uh, the rate, but in fact, once you have the, the tax deduction for the write-down of the IP, you can often wind up with an effective tax rate closer to 6%, uh, rather than the 12 percent. And there's actually the, uh, there's a, a knowledge box. Yeah, so the, the knowledge development box, or you know, some jurisdictions call it a patent box. This is broader than just patents. And my understanding is, and I, I needed to throw this in because I just like to say the term, but my understanding is that this was adopted in response to the shutting down of the, the double Irish sandwich structures that some of you may have heard about. Sound very exotic, but uh, uh, Essentially, they, they played on mismatches between uh, characterizations and rules in different jurisdictions to result in essentially well, lower or no tax payable. So the knowledge development box lowers the, uh, the corporate rate from 12 and a half to six and a quarter on income that's eligible for that. It does require, however, that the, the R&D work is performed in Ireland. So I think the minister and others have commented on this, that Ireland has a very competitive regime. But part and parcel of their competitive corporate regime, tax, corporate tax regime, is to incent economic activity and jobs in Ireland, which makes a great deal of sense. You lower the corporate rate, you provide great paying jobs and economic activity. You're also creating the personal revenue, personal tax revenue base uh, in your country. So the uh, last comment on the knowledge development box is, apart from that, that cut in the rate, that half cut, there's also a 25% tax credit for R&D work performed in Ireland. So you couple those together, and again, you have uh, an effective tax rate that is, is extremely competitive. And uh, just before we leave the topic, I think we'd have to mention that there are international pressures on the Irish tax story. Yeah, absolutely. And again, I think the minister uh, referenced some directly and indirectly. For one, uh, for those of you with working with multinationals, you'll be familiar to some extent with Canada's foreign affiliate regime. Ireland does not have a foreign affiliate or, or a controlled foreign corp regime. And they, uh, I believe it's the EU that mandated that Ireland adopt such a regime by the end of 2018. I understand that's still a work in progress. One of the consequences of adopting that regime will likely be uh, an incentive, if you will, to onshore back to Ireland certain activities, passive activities that are uh, out, presently in jurisdictions outside of Ireland. Again, from the Irish perspective, a good thing anytime you're bringing personnel, assets, activities back to Ireland, you're creating the economic activity, but you're fighting hard to maintain that extremely competitive 12.5% rate. So while some of those activities may now be in low or no tax jurisdictions, bring it back to Ireland, onshore to Ireland, derive that tax certainty where you're not on the crosshairs of every authority uh, across uh, the world, and, uh, and still benefit from that very, very competitive regime. Yes, uh, now I want to bring Emmanuel in on the other attractive features of Ireland. I, I, thanks uh, very much, David. And it is uh, it's a great opportunity 
for Ireland to be here in the room. I'll do the Irish accent first and Jimmy can do it later. <laughs> I, I can't get that about right, so I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, I think the, if we step back from it, rather than thinking about it in the context of just bullet points, my experience in this comes down to saying that what companies want to do and decision makers want to do is mitigate risk as much as they possibly can and make the right choice so that they can develop that sustainable competitive advantage on their own behalf and on behalf of their investors and their stakeholder group, which includes their customers. So the transparency of the environment, the ease with which you will move into that environment and leverage what's there because of the recognition by Ireland around the importance, 80% of our GDP comes from exports. And when you look at the fact that one in three export-related jobs comes from foreign direct investment, there's a government focus around making sure that Ireland has the right infrastructure in place. So when you have IBM location, IMD, Forbes ranking us, depending on whether you're talking about the OECD, the Eurozone, or indeed the rest of the world, in the top five, ranking from first place in the Eurozone to number four, on a global basis in the context of Ireland being the right place or a place where it's easier or easiest to do business. I think that speaks volumes. And you start to look at the common factors that draw into that decision. And among the most important within that context is undoubtedly the access to talent. If you can't get the folks, you can't provide the service. And Ireland's attitude to it, when you look at the fact that 15% of our labor force is now international. So you have major brands from around the world providing customer care, platform development, tech support, direct customer engagement on a first culture, first language across a multi uh, task, uh, a series of uh, tasks right across the entire internal value chain in anything from 40 to 60 languages. <coughs> There's a huge message in that. And the message is that people are comfortable to come and live and work in Ireland, which makes it a great place to uh, go and source the skill sets that you're looking for. This is, that's a point that Jay made, that it's a pretty easy place to attract people to work, to attract talent. It is, and there's a lot of discussion globally uh, for all sorts of reasons. Our near neighbours talking about immigration restrictions. There was a recent poll that took... Uh, from among Ireland had said in excess of 80% of people in Ireland were very comfortable with the direction the Irish economy was going and the makeup of the Irish workforce, effectively immigration. We're talking about it being an open environment and a welcoming environment. There's nothing new to people who know Ireland, but people who are trying to make a decision on a choice of location, it could be something that would be there in the back of your mind. And what's interesting at the back of that is to recognise that the Irish government put in place a framework where intercompany transfers, uh, where v the equivalent of green card processes can be accelerated and delivered for people who are outside of the European Union. I mean, we're an open border as far as the EU28 are concerned. But in the context of rest of world, you're looking at four to six weeks based on what your language requirement is. Remember I mentioned 40 to 60 languages. There are only 28, and God knows how many languages within you, the European Union are spoken. But when you walk the streets of Dublin or Cork, the minister's gone, so I can say that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you'll hear languages and accents that go way beyond the borders of the island of Ireland. And being spoken fluently, some of the companies that are down there and providing that first language capability. And that's borne out by the statistics when you look at the educational uh, profile. Over half of the uh, 24 to 35 age group, which is right in the middle of where you would be looking to get that skill set, complete third level education. And that's at least 10 percentage points ahead of the European uh, average. And the third point, the first one being ease of doing business, talent availability. And the third point in terms of access to your market. I mean, the reason we're doing this, folks, is to provide a platform for you to access and grow your market and to access your customers and be competitive. Ireland is a member of the European Union and we're not changing that. We're a committed, long-term member of the European Union, been in there since uh, 72, 
and we've been a founder member of the um, Eurozone. We have the, uh, a program called the Excessive um, Deficit Program, which is another word, another phrase for being bankrupt. And when we, when, we had, uh, when we had that experience along with the rest of the world, Ireland put in place a program which took us from 2011, where Moody's rated us as junk bonds and 11% government debt. Today, Moody's has expressed absolute confidence in Ireland in the context of a post-Brexit uh, environment. And that's basically down to the infrastructure and planning that's been put in place by the government. And as you heard from the minister and others, our uh, uh, government bond trades at just sub 1%. There's a huge endorsement there, and that's on the back of the type of planning. We don't do things by accident, we plan our way through it. And of course, we're all in uncharted waters, so we're kind of planning for the first time this process, and that's not unusual. Mm. Uh, at that point, I think we, we'll turn towards the future uh, and uh, speculate a little bit about uh, what Brexit might mean what CETA may bring. But Jamie, let's discuss Brexit. Firstly, can you explain why um, people are talking about these uh, large complex financial institutions like Credit Suisse uh, considering or relocating at least some of their operations from the City of London to Dublin? Sure, so the, the main reason is passporting or what's known as passporting, which has become a, a very key and topical um, word it comes up every day in the, in the press. So at its simplest, it's the ability of a financial service that's providing certain regulated activities under the EU single market directives. If it's, if it's authorized in a member state and has a license to carry out those activities in that member state, it is therefore entitled to cross-sell into the other 27 um, <coughs> countries on, on the same basis without having to be licensed in each of those states. So if you're licensed in Ireland to provide those regulated activities, you, you can, without having to get separate licenses from France, Spain, Italy, cross-sell into those countries on the same basis. And the thinking being that post-Brexit, it's clearly some of those financial institutions that are based in the large hub that is London will be restricted in some way post-Brexit. Exactly how, we don't know. But unless the UK opts, which is unlikely to remain in the EEA, that it's, it's going to be restricted somewhat. And it's very likely that in some shape or format, they will have to move some or all, all are very unlikely, but at least some people to bases within the other 27 to allow them to continue to cross sell into those countries without the red tape and the cost involved in getting licensed in other countries. Actually, can we bring Don in on this? I don't know if you feel comfortable speculating. Which direction are the Brexit negotiations looking like heading? Well, I was at a session yesterday, um, and uh, the comment was, um, I really hope that the Prime Minister, this would be May, uh, has a plan and knows where this is going, but I'm skeptical. Mm -hmm. And it comes down to just simply having the resources. Mm -hmm. um, you're taking maybe one of the most complex, because it's both trade and political integration, and you're breaking it apart. And um, a week before the Brexit vote, uh, the former cabinet secretary in the UK was speaking here in Toronto, and that's Lord O'Donnell, and he turned to our cabinet secretary and said, how many trade negotiators do you have? And uh, she shrugged and she, he said, you have 168, seven of whom have dual citizenship and we're talking to them all because, because we don't have one. Because the UK hasn't um, negotiated a free tra uh, any trade arrangement in over 43 years. And uh, the few experts they do have are working for the commission. So there is simply among the Mandarin and, and uh, these are competent, good people, they say they simply just do not have the capacity to do what's being asked for, ask of them, much less in the time frame that they do have. Yes, I mean, it's uh, uh, speaking personally, I find it very personally disappointing. I worked in uh, British politics to see the kinds of voices being sidelined. Uh, Lord Heseltine being fired from the government, uh, Kenneth Clark being sidelined, the kind of people who've supported Britain's integration into Europe. And uh, it really gives uh, me no pleasure as a uh, viewing from Ireland, the, the, the idea that uh, the UK may prefer not to have substantial access to the single market 
Uh, the phrase that's going around London at the moment is that no deal is better than a bad deal. Um, but uh, anyway, we, we can I just make one comment sure. on that? These these negotiations, I, you know, once they move to, they've got two years. Uh, CETA uh, and you know all these trade arrangements, and I'm not an, a, a CETA expert, but they all build on the successes and uh, lessons learned of previous ones. So by definition, this is you know the most advanced, and given the number of countries involved, you know one of the most complex. I mean, maybe the WTO um, uh, could uh, trump that, but uh, they. Um, They've got two years. Uh, the CETA arrangement, CETA deal was seven years. And hearkening back to Lord O'Donnell again, he said, you know, there's been one sub-sovereign, that would be Greenland, exiting um, the EU. He said there was one issue, that was fish. There was only goodwill, and that took four years. Yeah. Now, Jamie, uh, at the same time, Brexit, if it's going to be as... <coughs> Uh, hard as it currently uh, appears it may be, there will be opportunities of the type Credit Suisse have indicated. I think absolutely there will be, uh, but at, at the same time it's a, it's a bit of a delicate um, balancing game for Ireland Inc and for the, the professional advisors involved. As you mentioned, as the Minister mentioned, Ireland was against Brexit and the UK is our closest neighbour, biggest trading partner and shares deep social, political and economic ties. So we need to be careful not to be seen to be jumping up and down at the perceived uh, misfortune of the UK, but yet at the same time, if we're not alive to the, the very real opportunities that in particular the passporting uh, presents to us, we will lose out to what the other countries who are in the, in, in the frame, the likes of Frankfurt, Luxembourg and, pa uh, and, uh, and Paris. So for example, just, just yesterday, um, AIG announced that they were going to Luxembourg. There may be other insurance reasons for that. Um, we were speaking one of the Canadian banks just yesterday, myself and David, who has a large presence in London, and their informal view was that, in terms of Paris, unless you actually already had an established um, place of or operations there for, for linguistic and labour law reasons, why would you? So hopefully that puts Ireland in, 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 a good, in a good place. So for the reasons Emmanuel mentioned and the Minister also mentioned, it's, it, Ireland should, should be well placed to pick up some of this passporting business in whatever shape it takes. There is estimated to be approximately 300,000 passports or licenses emanating out of London into the rest of the other 27 countries, whereas only, approximately only 25,000 or so going back the other way. So clearly London is a massive financial hub. Not all of those are close to it will need to move, but a significant proportion of those will. But, but can Ireland uh, accept them? I mean, there's constraints. David Ehrlich uh, Absolutely. says that his residential units are 99% let. So, so where uh, will people live? Uh, so David mentioned Credit Suisse moving over kind of like a couple of hundred people as part of a trading floor. Other, 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 other institutions which are openly looking, we have the likes of Morgan Stanley, Barclays and, and Citibank all expecting to announce where they're going to go in some shape or format. And the, the key problems I think that Ireland are going to face are, are infrastructural. Uh, and David's mentioned some of them. So it's where will these people live, where will they work and how will they get to and from work? So the Irish property story is well known. We had a spectacular property um, boom and an equally spectacular bust. But the result of which was there, there was a good seven, eight, nine years where there was very little um, investment in residential infrastructure. So even at the moment, it's estimated that on the sales side, about 1% of the housing stock is uh, actually for sale, whereas for a functioning economy, it's estimated it should be four. There, the, the supply and demand for actual places to live based just on the current demands, it'll take 10 years for current rates of construction to meet the demands of the Irish market, let alone any influx that's coming in as a result of Brexit. But the, the government, and in particular Minister Coveney, has been alive to this, and there is a housing strategy. And I know David says it, it, it needs a little bit more work, but it, it, there is a fast track process for, for large residential units. There's been an investment in infrastructure to unleash, or unlock rather, uh, development sites in the Greater Dublin area. And there's been a commitment to doubling the number of units by 2020. And NAMA, the former bad bank, which David mentioned, has been given charge of, prov of um, providing 20,000 odd social units for, house for housing units, which will take away from the constraints in the greater Dublin area. The other main thing is where will they work? The where will they work situation is probably not as, not, not as bad, and we're, we're very well placed in that regard. Clearly, everyone, even if we want them all to come, won't come tomorrow. And as things are at the moment, there's four and a half million square foot of office space 
in the Greater Dublin area either being built or being refurbished with, with planning permission for another five million. So the key from an Irish perspective, from an Irish Inc perspective, is getting that stock ready and, get, and, and having it ready to go where, if and when these uh, financial institutions decant over to Dublin. There's, there's one point that I'd, I'd love to just pick up on if I, if I could, and it was a, a comment that, that Don made, and it's an interesting point when people talk about a two-year period uh, once Article 50 is triggered. I listened to our own ambassador, Ireland's ambassador to the European Union, Ambassador Kelleher, in January, and I can't remember the specifics of the timelines, but you must understand that that's a soup to nuts, that's a beginning to end process in terms of the time frame. Within that, there's a period for negotiation, there's a period for drafting, and then a period for redrafting, and then a period for renegotiation, and then you get to the, well, you're probably in year three or four at that stage. But the reality of saying, you know, so in the context of compressing it into a short time frame, it is, and especially in the context of how many executives and what sort of um, intellectual capital is behind it, it does underline the, the challenge. And I think that the uncertainty that that creates in the minds of a decision maker takes you back to where I started and you say, well, I want an environment where I know where I stand. But I think the two year period when you break it down, as any of us who've ever circulated a document to our board knows that that starts a long time beforehand or else you really have to, I don't know how you achieve it. I don't know how you achieve it. So that's just a small point that uh, I, I thought was worth bringing up. Two quick comments on the transitioning, either leading up to or, or post uh, Brexit. One is those structures that have a UK company with European subsidiaries underneath it right now benefit from the so-called EU parent, sub -direct, parent subsidiary directive, which eliminates withholding tax paid from, say, a European subsidiary up to a UK holding company. That obviously will, will no longer be, and so there's a, apparently a lot of consideration about uh, adding a, a, an Irish holding company to that structure and merging the UK hold co out of the UK into the Ir Irish hold co for continued access to and benefit from that EU uh, parent subdirective. Yes, so, uh, th that hasn't been a headline issue at all, but um, theoretically companies with uh, EU companies in their group could face a dividend withholding, uh, dividend stuck below, and we've been uh, advising on uh, cross-border mergers, true uh, mer mergers or fusions of companies into Ireland to remedy that. It's assumed at the moment that the UK, we don't know the final deal, but um, it's difficult to see how the UK could benefit from uh, the parent sub-directive in the future. It's a good, a good point too. And just a passing comment on the people that are going to be potentially moving to Ireland and, and personal level tax. Uh, this, you know, Ireland has this great, very low, very competitive corporate tax rate. Their personal tax rates are comparable to what we experience in Canada. I think, in fact, their highest marginal rate may be about a point and a half less than what we enjoy in Ontario. <laughs> <laughs> Couple, and add on, add on to that. But some of the thresholds start a bit. But the thresholds yeah. start significantly lower than our thresholds. So, yeah, maybe we do enjoy something in Ontario. I don't know. So uh, there's a bit apart. of planning to be done. For well, that, that's just it. Between that, when you're, when you're sending someone over, you know, they're, they're looking at their personal tax rate, they're looking at the VAT, which is about double ours here. So, you know, the VAT's in the mid-20s. The cost of living, uh, I understand there is no, there is nothing in Ireland comparable to our <coughs> stock option regime, which is a key component of the compensation, I suspect, of many of you. All to say a lot of uh, thought and planning needs to go in to, uh, to that piece before the person gets on an airplane. The trade between uh, Ireland and Canada is fairly modest. Yep. But, um, and we'll know next week on the 15th um, whether the populist uh, irritation or angst is an Anglo-sphere issue. You know, it seems like the Dutch are moving back away and uh, from... Uh, you know, following, you know, Trumpism and Brexit. But there is no doubt that in 
Ireland's principal trading partner and our principal trading partner, the border is thickening. And how long that goes on for, who knows, but it is a reality. And so what we can do, um, uh, in addition to the business that now exists, is provi provide platforms, you know, Ireland to the EU, and, you know, as everybody's touched on the, you know, with, in Canada's case, with the exception possibly the United States, the similarities between parliamentary systems and cultural affinities would be closest to Ireland of any of our trading arrangements. So it is incumbent on both countries and their policymakers to diversify trade. That does take time, but I think we've heard from here that whether it's financial services, which is without doubt the only, well, mining and financial services are, are Canada's, you know, world, world competitive industries, but it was touched on pharmacy, uh, pharmaceuticals, high tech, Toronto Waterloo Corridor, the second only to Silicon Valley. So, um, even though starting off the opportunities for doing, uh, working collaboratively, um, start from a modest base, I think there is um, considerable potential given the political unrest in the two, uh, in our two major trading partners. Yes, and the, the counterpart to our session here is a, a session that both Jamie and I have attended in Dublin uh, using Canada as a gateway to North American markets as a low cost. Uh, access point and CETA with the okay, removal of tariffs, uh, removal of non-tariff barriers, uh, mutual recognition of qualifications, which may be an in, a very important part in the uh, accessibility uh, to diversify into North American markets, uh, sending professionals one, in one direction and the other. Uh, so that's an, an important part of the background and maybe our future. So th thank you very much. We're uh, just at our time now, so I'd like to thank uh, my panel, uh, Emmanuel Dowdle, Don McCutcheon, Jamie Fitzmaurice and Paul Carenza. Thank you very much as well for attending. I really appreciate it. <laughs>